Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining our Facebook Live. Today, we will be talking about COVID-19 in the heart. We are here today with Dr. Mark Gonzalez and Dr. Willie Robinson, and I'll go ahead and let you both introduce yourselves. Well, I'm Dr. Willie Robinson. I'm an interventional cardiologist um, based out here at St. Charles uh, Parish Hospital. Good afternoon, Dr. Mark Gonzalez. Um, recent arrival to Louisiana. I'm Kenner based. I work in Laplace and St. Charles. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, today we're going to be discussing COVID-19 and the potential effects it has on your heart. Does it cause harm to your heart? Will you experience inflammation or long-term effects? Um, and we're going to go ahead and jump right on into our, our commonly asked questions by viewers. Um, if I have cardiovascular disease, what are ways I can protect myself against COVID-19? Well, that's a good question. Um, and it's uh, a good thing that the same things that we use to like everyone uses to protect themselves from uh, COVID-19 is the same that applies for people who have cardiovascular disease. And that would be uh, social distancing, uh, limiting the amount of people that you see and uh, keeping small groups if you, you do, or mainly keep it just the people that you live in your household. Um, also uh, face mask wearing. Uh, anytime you go outside um, or around people, uh, I really encourage that um, as well as hand washing. You want to always have wash your hands or have hand sanitizer on hand and avoid touching your face and eyes, um, especially. And Dr. Robinson, to go off of that, what are what are other effects COVID-19 can have on the heart? Oh, other effects. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, one um, could cause a fast heartbeat. Um, and that would just be a sign of infection. And it may be normal um, in many situations for your, your heart to increase in speed um, when you have some sort of infection. However, um, COVID may also um, cause your heart to go into an abnormal heartbeat, um, which we call an arrhythmia, um, commonly known as atrial fibrillation, which causes the top chambers of the heart to beat really fast and erratically. Uh, which sometimes may cause people to feel uh, palpitations or, or pounding of their heart and lightheadedness and shortness of breath and other, uh, other symptoms. Um, COVID-19 may also cause um, people to have uh, increased clots. And these clots, um, they may go uh, to your lung um, and cause uh, people to have really um, tight um, chest pain, or even severe shortness of breath, which could be a, an emergency that would um, require them to come to the ER. Or it can also go and cause um, clots in the heart arteries, which could lead to a heart attack, uh, which would also be a, an emergency. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. And Dr. Gonzalez, how can, can COVID-19 cause inflammation of the heart? It, it is an inflammatory disease. We, of course, are learning month by month, quarter by quarter, how serious this virus can affect a small portion of people. The majority of people that get the viral infection don't suffer the type of inflammatory disease that affects the whole body, including the heart. And that is fortunate. Uh, for instance, heart attacks are considered an inflammatory process. So as cardiologists, we have dealt with inflammation and markers of inflammation in other medical disease processes like heart attack. Even high cholesterol is considered an inflammatory disease. What we see with COVID in the heart is that this is like an injury to the body due to inflammation caused by the virus that we've never encountered. We do not see whole body systemic inflammation like we have with this 
infection such that the results of lung damage are evident with the scarring and the leading cause of death, which is, of course, pneumonia and lung failure. If you look at all complications of COVID, including the heart, you know, we see much more lung failure and infection problems. The heart is considered the third most common cause of death. And inflammation is tied in with that process such that, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, there is problems on the surface of the blood vessels that lead to and promote clotting that we generally don't see with many disease processes. Sometimes severe infections from bacteria can do it. Uh, Post-operative problems with a inflammatory response to a major surgery, for instance, trauma, major car wrecks. There are many examples of inflammation involved with injury to the body. It's just that scientists and doctors are still learning about these markers and how to pacify or combat this inflammatory process that affects every organ system in the body. So in simple terms, things like using steroids for COVID was started because of the research that showed so much inflammation associated with the infection. So it, it's not like a swollen knee or something like that, not that kind of inflammation. It's more like the body's immune response to the infection causes our immune defense to go haywire. And secondary complications occur from that, leading to disastrous outcomes such as strokes, heart attacks, things that we have dealt with for my whole career, but in people without any previous history of these type of problems. So even in the absence of pre-existing heart disease, we still worry about complications of the heart related to this hyperacuity of inflammation that occurs in the first couple of weeks of COVID infections, serious COVID infections. Uh, the all the some of the investigation that has taken place with inflammation leads to our next question, which is how common is myocarditis in young athletes after recovering from COVID infection? Myocarditis is a fancy word that just means inflammation of the heart. And the majority of our myocarditis patients tend to be less than say 40 years of age. We, we have always studied viruses causing myocarditis. So it was only intuitively natural that when this virus started attacking all kinds of people, including young athletes, the question became, when is it safe to turn these youngsters back onto the athletic field to do their sports? So there's been a lot of research with COVID survivors and they started doing imaging studies of the heart to look at the screening of survivors to see if there is any damage to the heart. And indeed, in many of these young people that were studied because they were collegiate athletes, football players, basketball players, they would do imaging studies of the chest and they found that there was heart involvement and these patients had nothing going on with their heart. They were not the type of disastrous COVID heart patients that we sometimes deal with, with strokes and heart decay, that there's ongoing disease process within the heart that we can't even identify yet. So clearly, I think that the take home message on inflammation of the heart, myocarditis, is that 
this process is yet to be investigated as to its severity and long-term uh, consequences. But in the short term, the good news is that many of these abnormalities that we're investigating have not impacted on survival or quality of life. And most of the young athletes that are being investigated have abnormalities on their imaging studies, but make a full recovery uh, to, to a full life long term. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, we do have a couple Facebook questions here. Um, one is from Kayla. She is asking, are the newer strains we are seeing more virulent and thereby more dangerous to our hearts? Uh, I think that that line of questioning is what everybody wants to know, how the new strains that evolve just like a common cold evolves new strains, the COVID seems to evolve strains. And that doesn't mean all the strains are more aggressive like we've been reading about in the newspaper. Uh, unfortunately, I think the long-term consequences of new strains will need to be tracked. And we're not gonna know for another couple of three months if there's really something to these new strains, our response with vaccines and treatments, because the worst case scenario is the virus mutates into more aggressive and aggressive uh, problems similar to bacteria that become back, back, you know, antibiotic resistant. And it is the natural history of things that invade the body that get more resistant to treatment, but we hope not in this case. So can COVID-19 cause long-term heart damage, Dr. Gonzalez? Well, most certainly uh, the, the, the majority of patients with heart complications of COVID are when you have the COVID and not projected to be long-term. That being said, if somebody has damage to their heart during their COVID infection, such as a heart attack, we treat them the exact same way as we would any heart attack for the majority of cases. The, the thinking with long-term damage from the virus itself is definitely something clinicians are tracking because this so-called subcategory called long COVID if you have symptoms more than 12 weeks, which can include chest pain and shortness of breath in the cardiac side of things, as well as symptoms such as fatigue, neurologic changes, headache, joint pains, myalgias, there seems to be a subset of COVID patients that extend out illness past 12 weeks. And I think that just like all sub investigate all investigations of this virus, we we don't know what to tell those patients. We think that some of the chest pain and shortness of breath resolves over time and may be more lung related than heart related. But uh, the majority of patients I've seen in follow up with chest pain and shortness of breath in recovery have those symptoms, but are actually functioning pretty well. They don't lead to long term things like risk of bypass or subsequent heart attack in the majority of people. About 10% of hospital discharges are readmitted for various problems in recurrence. If you can get out from your hospitalization more than two weeks and you're still recovering, then the chance of late complications are pretty low in the majority of people. Things like arrhythmias and uh, even complications like stroke can occur, but it seems to be in the first 10 days post illness and stabilization from hospitalization. All right. And Dr. Robinson, if I'm experiencing symptoms related to my heart, what are my options to seek care? Yeah. So you have a, a lot of um, options. 
um, to seek care. Uh, if you're having any symptoms, be it shortness of breath or leg swelling or problems laying, breathing when you lay flat, or if you, you're having ongoing chest pain, um, we, we, have all, um, we have a bunch of options for you to, to feel safe and come to the hospital. Um, one would be uh, if you're going to try to schedule an appointment in person, uh, we have many measures that we're taking in the hospital now to make you um, feel safe regarding um, reinfection or infection of COVID. And that'd be um, temperature checks. Uh, in 2021, we have all become quite accustomed to temperature checks now, um, just about anywhere we go, even going to the grocery store. So we, we have uh, at every entrance, we have um, dedicated people that are there to check your temperature. And they ask you a couple, um, like a, a few screening questions to make sure that you don't have any symptoms that may be related to, to COVID-19. We also inside, we're having um, decreased uh, amount of people in the waiting room. And so we have, since we have the limited capacity, we're taking, um, bringing in people into their appointments quite, once they sh uh, show up, uh, you get checked in and you come and then you, we go ahead and we uh, get you ready for your appointment. Um, so you're not congregating in the, the, the lobbies and with a lot of other people. And we also limit the amount of people in the hospital at one time um, to decrease uh, risk of exposure. Uh, and also one, one thing that uh, many of um, our department, many people in our department are doing, we're screening patients ahead of time, um, asking them questions, um, regarding their, their chances of, of COVID um, to decrease not just our exposure as physicians, but the exposure of our patients um, that come. And then we also have another um, great innovative um, addition to our, um, our, our visits, and that would be called our virtual visits. Um, so it's where we have the opportunity, similar to here, where we can virtually uh, meet with a physician, um, have our appointment. So uh, I could be here at work or in my office and you would be at home or, uh, or, or at work and uh, we would have our, our visit there. Um, and so you would still pro be provided with care uh, in, in the safety uh, of your, your, your home or your office. And Dr. Robinson, uh, we do have another question here on Facebook that goes off of that. It's from Katie. Should survivors of COVID who experience palpitation see a cardiologist to rule out long-term issues, even if symptoms are no longer happening? Uh, well, you could always, it's always better to be safe than sorry. Um, oftentimes, if uh, you were having palpitations uh, or um, heart pounding when you did have the infection, it could have been related to the infection itself because um, the heart can sometimes be like uh, an alarm. Uh, or a red flag, it'll, it'll, it'll have a red flag letting you know that, hey, there's something going on that um, we should probably look at. Um, but then when you do get further and further um, away from your infection and you recover, then your heart goes back to normal. Now, if you aren't having any further symptoms, um, it's always great to, to come to a doctor and, and talk to us about your prior symptoms. But if you aren't having any more symptoms, the, uh, the, the likelihood of finding um, say, for instance, an abnormal rhythm, if it's no longer happening, it'll be, be less. But uh, it's always great to, to, to be safe than sorry. And we, we also do have another question um, from Lauren. Would microvascular inflammation show in regular heart tests like an EKG, an echocardiogram, a stress mm -hmm. test? Oh, wow. See you I, both uh, laughing. <laughs> I, that, that sounds like a question from a nurse, to tell you the truth, but uh, <laughs> at least a nurse, um, because it's, it's a very intelligent question. Um, you know, we're finding that the microvascular component is, is pretty much confirmed with COVID, evidenced by the fact that about a third of our adult patients will show even blood test evidence of heart attack called a troponin lab value. And yet their arteries are normal and they have no cardiac issues. So clearly on the microvascular level with platelet clumps and our body's response to the inflammation, 
that moves through the blood vessels and lands into the small capillaries. And that we think is what's happening with the troponin rises and uh, evidence of heart attack in, in our COVID patients. So uh, we see both. We see my macrovascular where you have clots forming spontaneously going to the brain, clots going to the leg, or even clots inside the heart triggering heart attack. So that's macro and then you have micro. So I think that we see the full spectrum of, of inflammatory uh, uh, markers and clumps of platelets. And these are the problems that lead to stroke and heart attack commonly. It starts microvascular and then extends. I, I think there's a lot of that. And so uh, we do have one other question that just came through. Um, it is from Deshane. Has there been more heart attacks since the pandemic? Well, so because of, uh, well, we, we both are um, smiling or smiling on that because it, overall there, there has been a decline um, in terms of acute heart attacks um, that we see patients in the, the ER and in the hospital. Uh, myself being an interventional cardiologist and also a Dr. Gonzalez, um, there, there have been less um, heart attacks that we've had to, to go ahead and put stents in. However, we're, we're also learning that some patients are uh, avoiding coming into the hospital to, uh, because of fear of COVID and the chest pain that they have at home um, you know, they may um, say, OK, it's not that bad. And so uh, I'll just wait it out. And sometimes that doesn't uh, go too well. Um, and so then they present with uh, really bad symptoms or, or, or major heart damage um, after having their heart attack at home um, without seeking care. So it is important to if you have if you're having um, these these types of symptoms, um, to present to uh, to the ER or to the hospital to get help, or at least call your your primary care doctor or your cardiologist um, to ask questions on what you should do if you're having symptoms. You know, and they, and, and they've even uh, yes, I, I'd like to add one thing. They've even uh, hypothesized that perhaps the shutdowns uh, and lifestyle changes involving, for instance, going out and eating large meals, uh, perhaps a change in lifestyle with tobacco after a large meal in restaurants. Some of the restrictions and things are also believed somehow to be a factor with less heart attacks in our community. Uh, we don't really understand that. I mean, there's even a 50% drop in, in cardiac surgeries elective and emergent. So there are all these trend changes that have occurred because of the pandemic. And I think it's going to take some a long time to sort all this out, to really uh, investigate the, the demographics of these questions, like less heart attacks in the community. Because we just don't under, we're just making observations. We don't really understand it yet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So is there any recent research that you can share about COVID-19 in the heart? Well, uh, I don't have, I don't study COVID patients like research. We, I haven't really seen a lot of cardiac enrollment in studies. It's, it's so common, these patients, we're just trying to keep, keep things going in my opinion. So no, no ongoing trials, but I did want to uh, highlight the presence of, the findings you may have seen re regarding amputations and cold extremities. Uh, Dr. Robinson and I treat legs with blockage, with balloons and stents and things that are required to treat gangrene and stabilize circulation problems. So the difference in this disease process is that I mean, there's commonalities and then there's differences. One is it's more legs than arms. 70% of the cold extremities from COVID are, are legs. We see it more commonly with our elderly patients. 
with obese patients and patients with cardiovascular risk factors, such as diabetes and hypertension and kidney failure, for instance. And, you know, it tends to more commonly occur in someone with no previous history of vascular disease. And it tends to occur within the first week of the infection and present with what they call the six P's, which is a, kind of an acronym for, for like cold leg, pulselessness, paralysis, paresthesias, cold, coldness, whiteness, pallor to the leg, and pain. So once these patients develop this critical limb ischemia, we have to treat them the same way we do as any vascular patient with balloons, stents, clot buster, blood thinners. But the extent of clot in the COVID patient is much more extensive. So right now there's studies being formed to streamline the best management for the limb ischemic patient. But amputations are more common in COVID patients because of the amount of clot and the process that the doctors are dealing with relative to the historical plaque, no flow in the arteries. This is all blood clot and it's a little bit tougher to treat. And these people are ongoing with their COVID infection involving the lungs and other disease processes involving the kidneys. So it, it really is a small subset of patients, but one that challenges stabilization of these arms and legs, uh, as well as strokes. I think the, the second discussion of research that no one has the answer on is reinfection. Uh, everybody's heard of people that have had reinfection. I think that the, the world scientific body is trying to sort this out. Uh, classically, definitively, in the United States, they've, they've found five cases. In the world, 50 cases. So even though there's a lot of belief that we can get reinfected and how long will the vaccines hold us, do you need boosters, I think that the limitation to sorting all this out is the, the genome in research that needs to be done. And in the United States, we're not that good at that. We, we're like 40, 43rd in the world of genome research. So you need to, every time you think there's a new strain, you have to do the genome sequencing and it gets very complicated. So for now, I think we should be reassured that it's not an impending guarantee that there's going to be reinfection issues. But I think from what I've seen, there's gonna be booster shots, just like you get a flu, flu shot, you're gonna get another COVID shot on a, on a yearly basis or whatever the guidelines dictate based on science when we learn a little bit more about the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, and we did have one more question. Uh, Dr. Robinson, if you have AFib, how is it impacted by COVID or is it impacted at all? Yeah, so uh, actually um, for many people that have uh, atrial fibrillation, if you develop an infection um, that sometimes can cause uh, or any infection, not just COVID, um, that can cause the the atrial fibrillation to 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 go into overdrive um, and cause uh, your heart rate to be sometimes as high as 150, um, if not higher, uh, and cause people to have sensation of chest pain or chest tightness, shortness of breath, palpitations. Uh, and some people, they don't uh, react at all. <laughs> so um, it, it's very possible to, to have higher heart rates um, when you're infected, uh, especially with COVID. Um, and sometimes some people don't, their heart rates remain the same. So yeah, if you, but if you do notice that you have um, some sort of infection and you have a high heart rate, you should um, contact your, your physician uh, immediately and you get some advice. 
All right, and that is all of the questions that I have today. Thank you everybody for joining our Facebook Live. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Robinson or Dr. Gonzalez or make an appointment with them, we will leave their links in the comment section. Um, and if you'd like to more learn more about cardiovascular care at Auctioner, you can go to www.auctioner.org slash cardio. And thank you guys for joining us.